Welcome everyone to the session on the importance of cutting edge solutions in forestry, agroforestry and biodiversity. Um, before I introduce our panel of experts today, I'm just gonna very brief overview of why this topic is so critical. Um, so I'm Lucy Armand, uh, Chair of Nature for Climate, the coalition hosted by the Nature Conservancy. Um, I also lead communications for um, the Tropical Forest Alliance and other nature-based solutions work within the World Economic Forum. Um, so Nature for Climate is an initiative of 19 international organizations, including UN agencies, NGOs, and private sector coalition groups. And our mission has been to promote the role of nature as an essential climate solution alongside decarbonization. And our advocacy platform has been focused on mobilizing action and investment into high integrity areas that will accelerate nature-based solutions. So this topic today is very important. When we first started out back in 2017, we used social media technology to monitor the, the prevalence of nature-based solutions within the climate debate, and it was about less than 1%. So obviously in that time, things have skyrocketed and at COP26, thanks to the efforts of many partners, many of yourselves, nature kind of went mainstream. Um, but clearly that isn't enough. So the hard work of high integrity implementation of nature-based solutions continues today, which brings us to our conversation. Where does technology come in? Um, there are a wealth of ways in which the latest technology advances uh, can be deployed in the service of climate and nature. Um, we're gonna hear about geospatial mapping, artificial intelligence, and many other forms of technology. And our belief in Nature for Climate is that these types of technology are crucial for helping to create transparency, accountability, and build trust. And the money is flowing to the right places and the carbon is actually being stored. Um, so Impact Alpha recently reported that there's funding for climate tech startups at around $17 billion in the first half of 2021 alone. So imagine if we could create a similar market for what we call nature tech um, and what that would mean for our mission to tackle climate change and protect and restore ecosystems. So today we have a fantastic panel of experts joining us to discuss how these technologies uh, can be applied. So I'd like to welcome Miriam Crichton, Managing Director for Earth Intelligence, Jason Schatz, da Data Science Manager for Descartes Lab. We have Craig Mills, CEO of Visuality, Alexis Moyer, Geo Geospatial Analyst for Spatial Intelligence, uh, sorry, Space Intelligence, and John Pierre, CEO of Geotree. So we will turn, um, first of all, to um, Mariam to give us a brief introduction. Hello, I'm Mariam Crichton, the Group MD of Four Earth Intelligence. Our name is a clue to what we do. 4EI uses space data for the betterment of humans and the planet. Uh, we monitor environmental change uh, through, with a focus on nature-based solutions. Whilst we have a um, wide range of applications with um, often Earth observation at its heart, um, I think this audience will probably be more interested in um, our cutting edge soil um, um, monitoring and uh, our bread and butter is habitat mapping uh, for both oh. land and marine. We also, I spend a lot of my personal time with the um, innovating in the uh, sustainable finance unit, and we focus on four areas. Uh, we have cross-functional finance environment technologists, and we work on natural capital, biodiversity, sustainability linked debt, and of course, uh, carbon finance. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Mariam. And now handing over to Jason, welcome. Thanks, Lucy. Um, so I'm Jason Schatz, Science Lead for Sustainability at Descartes Labs. Um, and to introduce myself, I actually want to go way back to uh, 1990. So when I was growing up, I watched a lot of nature documentaries. And I really distinctly remember when I was eight years old watching a documentary um, about the greenhouse effect on public broadcasting, which, of course, we now call climate change. Um, 
And the show described climate changes, uh, causes, consequences, and just generally how terrifying it was. Um, and at eight years old, it was probably the first time in my life that I experienced real existential dread about anything. Um, and ever since that day, climate change has pretty much always been on my mind. It guided my academic career. I got bachelor's in environmental science, master's in forestry, PhD again in environmental science. Um, it guided my advocacy. So 15 years ago, a friend of mine and I started a nonprofit in our hometown of uh, Dubuque, Iowa. <laughs> um, and we pushed it to become one of the first cities in the world to commit to a 50% by 2030 greenhouse gas reduction way back in 2012. And it uh, guided my career where I've moved from doing very hands-on ecological field work to more recently using satellite imagery to map and monitor ecosystems all around the world. So in that vein, for the past few years, I've worked at Descartes Labs, where my job is to lead a team of really wonderful, brilliant scientists building tools to uh, eliminate forest loss and degradation from global supply chains. So we're building things like deforestation monitoring tools, biomass monitoring systems, and more recently, uh, biodiversity monitoring tools. And in the panel, there are three points that I'll um, keep coming back to. So first, uh, emerging technology has made global scale satellite based MRV possible right now. Um, the second piece is that tech is only half the battle. We have a ton of work to do still to align technology with commitments and reporting standards. So the tech we develop can power genuine solutions. And the third thing is there's precious little time for us to figure this out. You know, if we learned one thing from Glasgow, it's that there's still a lot of hope and opportunity, but not a lot of time. So really looking forward to it. Great. Thank you very much, Jason. Okay, we'll hand over to Craig from Visuality. Oh, I'm sorry, Craig, you're on mute. I had to be the one to do it, didn't I? You had to be. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's guaranteed. All right. So uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name's Craig Mills. I'm the CEO of Visuality. And Visuality, we've been helping um, non-profits, universities, governments, um, citizens for the, over a decade now um, in understanding the change in our planet. So everything from uh, deforestation through Global Forest Watch, um, where illegal fishing is happening with Global Fishing Watch, um, tracing the, the flow of commodities across um, the world with Trace, and all of these have been in partnership with uh, with institutions committed to creating open public good um, around data and technology. Um, and in recent years, we have sort of turned our attention more towards, well, we're doing both actually, but towards companies who are now becoming more and more interested in changing their operations using these types of technologies, but within their companies, which is wonderful to see. As, um, I've been in this space for maybe 20 years, and this is the most kind of, there's almost been an ex um, exponential increase in interest um, from the corporate sector in the last few years. So that's that's really wonderful. Um, uh, maybe I can give you a little bit about myself. Uh, I think my only existential problems I had when I was eight was whether Liverpool were going to win the Premier League or not. Um, <laughs> I did grow up by the sea. Um, my education is in uh, biology and marine biology and fisheries. Uh, and I've gradually worked my way through government, um, non-profits, uh, the UN, and now visuality. Um, and along the way, um, I've, my belief that any of these technologies um, uh, that we're going to deploy in the next, well, if we go with biodiversity in the next, if the commitments happen this year, in the next, what, eight years, uh, uh, we'll have to be. We we'll have to figure out how to do it out in the open, as transparent as possible, um, available to as many people as possible to innovate as far and wide as possible. Um, and so we have a commons problem which we need to resolve. Um, and that's that's where we are. That's visuality right now. We sit all over the world. Most of our people are in in Madrid, um, where we have scientists, engineers, designers, um, and we have a big focus on how people use information. So lots of interesting people in this panel creating the types of data and technologies which we then try and embed into other people's um, organisations or share with the world. Great, thanks very much, Craig. Thank you. And now we will turn to Alexis from Space Intelligence. Over to you, Alexis. 
Thanks, Lucy. Hi, I'm Alexis. Uh, and as Lucy said, I'm from Space Intelligence. Um, I have a quite similar background to Jason in that I also have a bachelor's degree in environmental science, a master's in geoscience, uh, and I recently completed a PhD in geoscience as well from the University of Edinburgh here in Scotland. Um, and I also have quite a mixed uh, background in using remote sensing technologies um, to look at environmental applications, as well as a wealth of field data um, information as well, uh, including collecting data um, off glaciers in Greenland, which was for my PhD, um, setting up field trap cameras and things like that in British Columbia for my master's degree. So really a mix of technical um, and, and field data on my side. Um, and a bit about space intelligence. We are a climate tech startup based in Edinburgh, Scotland with a wealth of knowledge in uh, satellite remote sensing and machine learning techniques, uh, which allow us to provide environmental data and insights for large corporations and financial institutions and governments as well, who are interested in doing things like habitat mapping for natural capital investments, um, as well as looking at nature-based solutions monitoring through time to provide data for verification of carbon crediting and to provide data um, looking at changes in land use, for example, deforestation or forest degradation, which helps these organizations decide where they should be doing the restoration work, which areas are more critical to tackle first um, is something else that we provide. Uh, we're rapidly expanding and, and as we continue to growing, we're moving into providing investors and asset managers with environmental data, data to help them make uh, more nature positive investment decisions. So for example, we can look at the historical land use change in a region uh, where they want to make an investment and, and say, okay, this area was deforested in 2009 and this is how much CO2 was released because of this palm oil mill that you want to invest in. So helping people make better investment decisions to tackle their net zero ambitions um, and improve biodiversity. So yeah, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and uh, excited to have a good discussion. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Alexis. Um, and finally, we'll turn to John, um, who is the CEO of GeoTree. Over to you, John. Hi, thanks, Lucy, and uh, hello to everyone in the uh, in the audience. Um, so, a bit of self introduction. I think I have a slightly different background to probably the rest of the panel. Uh, my prior experience was in commodities trading, so I was a agriculture commodities trader. Um, you know, actually, I've worked at uh, Citibank, uh, Goldman Sachs. Um, you know, some hedge funds, uh, Mercury Energy Trading, and Hartree Partners as well. So, very much uh, experience on the financial uh, market side. Uh, but that's actually what got me into remote sensing and satellite imagery. So, you know, I started to dabble in using NASA data sets and ESA data sets to model crop production globally and take a view on the financial markets. Um, but I think here, obviously, we have a really great use case of how remote sensing could be used um, to really make a difference in climate change. At GeoTree, we're laser focused on providing best in class digital MRV solutions across the whole nature based solution space. So whether that's forestry, agroforestry, um, regenerative agriculture, so things like um, rice, methane abatement, soil carbon, and then also getting into things like grassland management, and of course, uh, you know, the, the sweet spot of, of blue carbon and things like mangrove restoration as well. So I think, you know, in GeoTree, we have, I think a real, you know, deep technical bench of people with experience in financial and carbon markets. Uh, we have people with, you know, lots of experience when it comes to remote sensing, and we have quite a few PhDs who have experience as well in biogeochemical modeling. So hopefully we can bring all those worlds uh, together to really make a difference from a monitoring, reporting, verification, but also feasibility and other parts of the project development um, pipeline. Anyway, thanks for your time today. Great. Thanks very much, John. Um, so we'll just um, open up um, to some questions for the panelists here. Um, so you've, you've, most of you have referenced a kind of what Craig called an exponential growth in interest in this area from the private sector, particularly. What, what is the real value of the types of technologies that you're deploying for these private sector organizations and governments who are looking to deploy um, nature-based solutions? And it would be really helpful if you could draw on specific examples of either companies or sectors that you're working with, where you can see something has really changed in the last 10 years of what you're able to do for these organizations. So, um, Mariam, I will turn to you first. What, what I guess the question here revolves around um, what value do we add beyond you know just measurement, and I think the value that um, our technology adds is uh, credibility and integrity to the 
uh, carbon markets. So we add um, transparency and accountability at a time where people talk about greenwashing a lot. Um, we provide, our technology um, can provide irrefutable, unbiased evidence. And that's how it um, contributes to the transparency and accountability. So that's a, a one reason to adopt the technology. And I think also one important note about the value is, um, particularly with the use of Earth observation and remote sensing, is that um, you know we're independent verification partners. So we don't actually have to talk to a company to know what they're doing. We can independently, we do this, find out for uh, an investor, et cetera, um, what's going on. And I think um, it can be quite controversial, our technology, because we're being disruptive in a market where everybody relies on second party opinions and um, assumptions and assumptions where we're providing actual evidence. So this can be quite actually scary for people to adopt. Um, so um, that's, the, I think, the value of what we provide Great, thanks, Miriam. Jason, um, would you add anything to what Miriam has said uh, with regard to that? Yeah, I, I agree with everything Miriam said. Um, I think you know, for us, we found that remote sensing MRV isn't isn't perfect, but it is a lot of the things that Miriam mentioned. It's transparent; everyone can look at the same imagery. That's the basis of the analyses. Um, it's global in scale. It's uh, scalable, you know, you can, um, you don't have to send out field crews, although um, that's also important, but, you know, generally you can monitor entire countries or entire supply chains across the world in a really consistent way. Um, and for us, one specific example is working with uh, Unilever to bring transparency and consistency across their global supply chains and helping them move to a place where um, they can understand the deforestation impact of their supply chain operations and their suppliers and like move to a place quantitatively, not just qualitatively where like, you know, they start at a baseline and move eventually toward um, their zero deforestation commitments. Great. Thanks, Jason. Craig, do you have any um, examples from your work where you sort of really see the, the added value of this from a private sector perspective? Yeah, sure. Um, okay, so let me give you one example. We've worked with recently, we've worked recently with uh, Mars. And um, the, one of the first areas that you have to look at across their supply chain is, is kind of the high level screening um, look across impact. Um, and so with a company of that size, which operates in so many spaces, then the use of remotely sensed data and on the ground data to be able to quantify impacts of carbon or deforestation or, uh, or water um, is something that we have done with largely actually using information um, from, again, from like public resources, uh, things like Global Forest Watch and Aqueduct. Um, uh, or you know the world database and protected areas for seeing what protected areas are that kind of thing um, and what we've managed to do is look at their operations right now and, and it depends where they are in the business right so if you're in the board you might want you know high level indicators of, of performance across the whole suite of things that are happening um, or if you are a, a you know a commodity purchaser then maybe you want to know the impacts of your your purchase choices at that moment in time or at least you know within a like a monthly basis, something like that. So underpinning all this is a, is a, is a group of data, which then um, information is extracted from and presented to the various actors within those businesses, and they get to understand you know, the state. But that's only the first bit. Then you have to produce d data and information where people can act. And in the case of, say, Mars, that type of information may be in how they formulate their recipes, where they're making choices on a particular um, I don't know, Mars produce a lot of pet food, so maybe they choose chicken over beef. So just little things like that, or they supply, um, yeah, they supply some kind of grain from one place to another. Or There's lots of things which are tricky amongst all that, and there's lots of knock-on effects and feedbacks that happen as a result of those decisions, but the information at least gets you to the point where you can act in the business to change, to actually meet the targets which are generally set a little higher up the chain. Great, interesting. Um, Alexis, um, what about from your perspective? Yeah, I mean, I, I would agree with 
everything that's already been said and to add on to that, uh, what value do I see um, our technologies kind of providing in addition to those things? Um, our, we have quite a large focus on making products that help make decisions, um, providing useful tools that it's not just providing a map showing, you know, what the habitat changes in that area, but then how that information can be used and implemented, whether that's for a company or a government going forward. Um, so for, uh, for a specific example, um, we produced a map of land cover over all of Scotland recently that the Scottish government is, is using to assess their natural capital assets across the country on an, an annual basis. And that how that information is changing and what they can, how they can use that information to better make decisions regarding how they change the landscape or for, for example, how they restore a peat bog in the north of Scotland, because they didn't know before where which area was best suited for restoration. So really making it a decision making tool, uh, I think is, is something that is value added on to just providing a map with field data. Great, thanks, Alexis. And um, John, uh, finally, from your perspective. Yeah, thanks, Lucy. So I guess we have a slightly um, different perspective because we very much play upstream in the supply chain, so to speak. So talking to project developers who want to actually do projects around, um, you know, ecosystem restoration, sustainable agriculture and the like. And, you know, we have to take it for, you know, as a kind of given that public companies on the other end are going to have more net zero commitments and the like. But the real bottleneck in the market and the pain point that I see anyway, and a lot of people I speak to, is around how do we scale the actual supply of projects on the ground in those countries where that's feasible. So with that in mind, right now, current MRV, as, as I guess Jason was kind of alluded to, you know, it's a bit, um, you know, it's a barrier to entry for many smaller project developers and also being able to scale, like sending people out into the, into the Amazon with measuring sticks or whatever, that, that doesn't make any sense, right? So I think that's why we can really leverage remote sensing, the new capabilities which are coming in in the future, which I'm sure we touched on a bit later, to really reduce the cost of MRV, do more analysis around things like feasibility, project design, and all these different bells and whistles we can add. But also, I think unlock finance, which is already there and waiting. I think some of the attendees, attendees on, on this conference are probably waiting to make those natural capital biodiversity investments. But they need to have real um, appreciation that these project developers on the ground are doing things in a kind of way that meets the basic criteria. So I think that's where you know, we can come in, unlocking access to finance for project developers, having cost-effective MRV, and making sure that that side of the market, the supply side, for the voluntary carbon markets can scale going forward. Great, thank you very much. Um, I know from the questions that are coming in from the audience, um, somebody uh, has commented that um, yes, the data does need to be freely available, but someone still needs to fund its data collection. Um, and it's important that we don't undervalue that. So I'm just wondering, um, Craig, I'm gonna turn to you. How and why should businesses need to be investing in this uh, data collection kind of upfront? Do you see evidence of them being willing to do so? Uh, to, to answer the last part of your question, yes, yes, I have seen evidence that um, certainly with the, the large players that where there's gaps in information that they are willing to, to invest and they typically are doing that by um, uh, forming collaboratives with uh, maybe other companies, other uh, non-profits, academics, in order to do that. I mean, if you just look at the um, the sums of money that people like well, Microsoft, Amazon um, are putting into to this, you can tell that these sort of fundamental data sets are important. It's not even close to being enough, but it's it's a good start. Um, the and then you look at you know the types of businesses that we've been working with um, it's in the food manufacturing world. Um, and they are also seeing large gaps in things like where assets are, you know, where the mills, the factories, the, all those kinds of things are to doing footprint analysis. And I can imagine, I mean, there's rumblings of talk about, oh, no, and they are already funding initiatives to, to, to do these kinds of things. Um, but that doesn't actually get to the, the root of the real challenge. Um, because it, the thing that's perhaps not often talked about with remote sensing is that if we're using machines to teach um, well, if, if machines are learning how to detect where biodiversity is um, at its highest value, if you want to call it that, um, it requires a huge amount of knowledge and a huge amount of data around where biodiversity are, the primary biodiversity data. 
Um, and that is woefully um, under, well, there's, there's just simply not enough information out there. There's huge gaps in it, both from a taxonomic point of view and a spatial point of view. And through no fault of, you know, I guess, historical funding of, kind of Europe and North America, where most of the data are. Um, um, yeah, and, and so actually, <clears throat> for us to be able to train the machines correctly, there probably needs to be some billions spent on in investments in novel ways of collecting biodiversity data. And I think, <clears throat> um, I think Kath Taylor probably, I think you work for Nature Metrics, which is an eDNA company, right? Um, and um, th that is one of the mechanisms that I can see as being hugely valuable and massively upscaling biodiversity information across the world that has to be paid for. And personally, because it's the commons, I think it should be paid for by governments even though it seems to be the private sector that's stepping up and the philanthropic people that are stepping up to pay for it. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a challenge. But I don't start from the point of view that you need to, um, that let's get it paid for first and then worry about how to open it up. I think the pillar has to be open it up and then figure out the, the business models around it. Great, thanks Craig. And Jason, I know you wanted to come in here as well. Yeah, I think, um, I think, Craig and Visual already have this right in a lot of ways. Like once um, kind of the raw data layers are in a good state where they're sufficiently accurate and uh, meeting all the basic needs they need to, it's, you know, it becomes a problem of thinking about the user experience and really translating raw data into usable insights. That's really the key to making an impact on a lot of this stuff. Um, and from my perspective, I think it, it is important to balance incentives for private and public sector to invest in technology and data that we need to generate um, and also for it to be freely available in at least some form. And, you know, there are ways to do that, like non-commercial use licenses to make it freely available to some users, um, subscriptions for commercial users. Um, like for one of the ways we're going about that, we have a program called uh, Powered by DL. This is a very shameless plug. Um, <laughs> where it's some of our forest monitoring layers, for example, like you know, tree cover change detection, above ground biomass are available for subscription. Um, and we're still working on the um, non-commercial side of that. But uh, you know, the idea is that we can provide some of the foundational data layers people need so they can skip some of the raw data creation steps and move a little more quickly toward creating um, finished products and applications. Um, because I think that there is definitely a lot of, uh, you know, there are a lot of groups around the world working on like creating exactly the same data layers. Um, so yeah, hopefully there are probably ways to remove some of that redundancy. Great. Thanks, Jason. And Mariam, I think you wanted to just come in and hear on, on, on the end of this question too. Yeah, it's just just to, to add to what Jason and Craig have said, you know, we talk about data. A lot of our work's in the Gulf cooperating countries. We work for governments. So they do, they are it, well, it has to be an innovative government that is brave enough to use innovative technology. Um, you know, what we need the data, the first step is what anyone does is collect the data before we can produce insights. So that before we do natural capital accounting, etc., we need to know what's there. So the, we have found that governments are do care about paying to collect data and want to have the, all the data they can. But then when it comes to the costs for the private sector, there's always a, a question mark. And when it comes to data, there's a lot that's freely available and there's a lot that we can all do. And there's a lot of products that we can create. But when it comes to biodiversity, you know, if we want to be measuring turtle nests from space. We need to pay. And for all of us, we, we can't do our work without the satellite imagery. And I feel that, yes, there is a lot of free, out, free stuff out there, but to solve the global nature and climate problem, um, we all need to come together. And at the moment for, you know, sort of smaller technology companies and for the cost of the projects, it, it can be prohibitive with the cost of our imagery that we have to pay from whoever it is that sells it. So yes, we can give you free data, but if you want the really fantastic twice a day monitoring 30 centimeters data, you have to pay a lot of money. And so that um, restricts who can use that. So I think that is a, a barrier to innovation is the cost of 
the imagery that we have to use for certain applications. Thank you. Um, so we had a question come in from Sebastian Gertner um, about benefits to local communities who uh, live and work within these ecosystems. So I'm just wondering, Marianne, I'm going to come to you again first on this. Um, do you have examples or um, a sort of sense of how these high tech solutions can actually benefit the communities that matter most on the front line of climate change and nature based solutions? I've got one example. I come from a social impact background in international development, um, as well as geospatial. So, um, you know, what's really interesting is in the tech, technology in social impact. There's a lot of on the ground activities in social impact, but the use, you, there's quite a specific knowledge on how to use technology interventions. Um, and I believe for social impact, you know, knowledge, attitude, behavior change, it's a long term thing that needs to be designed at the very beginning of projects. And while we're looking at environmental impact, we should also consider the social impact and what our technology can do to measure both. And a lot of it will come from the design of the project, I think. So we were in a really we're working on a really beautiful project um, in Kenya. It's an agroforestry project where our sort of uh, carbon sequestration product is being about to be deployed and there the design of that project um, is small scale farmers who've got small farms one to two hectares um, they're being encouraged to plant trees um, and as independent verification partners we say there wasn't a tree they planted the tree we work out the biomass and the credit but that credit then goes towards uh, financial compensation to the farmer and it could be in the form of a school loan etc so designing projects or finding um this is a private sector project too so finding the business models within this type of project is uh, is where we need to all come together and be clever great thanks very much alexis um We've had a question that's come in around the gold standard, um, not formally uh, supporting remote sensing for validation. Um, so I'm just wondering, John, are you happy to come in and answer what do you think um, is needed to get these standards to support remote sensing for MRV? Yeah, yeah, I can do that, Lucy. And, and to be clear, I think it's probably going a bit fast saying that, you know, the standards aren't open to remote sensing. Uh, Vera, for example, who, you know, probably do the lion's share when it comes to nature based solution methodologies. Um, they've already, you know, started to incorporate more remote sensing in some of the methodologies around agroforestry and, and um, you know, afforestation and, and, and reforestation as well. Um, when it comes to agriculture, we're seeing some of the language to be more friendly towards remote sensing. Um, I think, you know, they've, they've also started to uh, a digital MRV group, I believe as well. So it's clear that all the standards and I, Gold Standard has done the same. So all the standards are recognizing that the technology has evolved over time and they do want to incorporate um, you know the, these methods and just to be clear it doesn't necessarily have to be only the monitoring piece that is used in the process uh, um, in the project life cycle you know there are things like um, dynamic baseline analysis and, and leakage analysis which could also lean on some of the remote sensing capabilities that we're discussing here so i expect that to evolve over time the standards are very open to discussing um, how we can bring in new technology they're forming working groups you know, adjusting the standards. So I think that's a door that's, it's it's a jar and we can we can open it when we have more examples of project on the ground, actually implementing some of the technology we're talking about. Great, thanks very much, um, John. We've had a question come in focused on biodiversity. Um, so how is bio biodiversity monitored with remote sen sensing? What indicators are used um, in this respect? So I'm gonna turn first to Alexis and then Jason to answer that question. Great, thanks. Uh, I think this kind of plays back into a bit about what Miriam was saying about how you can get really, really high resolution data, uh, although it's very expensive. So that is one, one way you can measure biodiversity, for example, tracking certain species, identifying species. But again, that's not very realistic um, due to the, the limitations of the cost of that type of data. Um, so here at Space Intelligence, we focus more on vegetation as a proxy for wider biodiversity. Um, a lot, you can learn a lot about vegetation from remote sensing data, and then you can use that information um, to, to look at things like vegetation health, the time of greening of an environment, plant stress, all of which uh, feeds back into the biodiversity of that area. 
Um, you know, if the vegetation is not doing well, the species that live in that forest are not going to be doing well either. So we kind of use that as a proxy for biodiversity. Um, in addition, things like looking at landscape fragmentation. So for example, if the forest is cut into two, um, species that live there are not going to be able to effectively cross between those two habitats. So you're gonna lose a lot of biodiversity potential in that type of era. Those, those are just a few of the things that we can use to measure biodiversity. Thanks, Alexis. Jason? Yeah, I, I agree with all of that. And I liked um, hearing the word indicators in the question because you know there, there are a lot of dimensions to biodiversity. Like we're um, remote sensing isn't very good at uh, measuring like genetic diversity from space, but you know, satellites can measure other dimensions like uh, functional diversity, structural diversity, um, ecosystem diversity, um, some of the things Alexis mentioned, like uh, intactness and degradation and just the presence of various ecosystems in various places that we know correlate with other dimensions of biodiversity, like you know, genetic, phylogenetic, and uh, the presence of different keystone species we might be worried about. So instruments like, um, you know, we've always had Landsat, we have Sentinel-2 and Sentinel-1 now that provide a lot of good information on those fronts. Um, we have instruments like JEDI that provide like good information about the structure, um, the structural diversity of forests and other ecosystems. Um, NISAR and biomass satellites are coming out now that's gonna provide even more information. So, um, so yeah, there's, um, there's a lot we can measure. And I think the key is really tying that and correlating that to the, um, biodiversity metrics that we ultimately care about. Great, thanks, Jason. I know that um, both Craig and John want to come in on the biodiversity topic too. So Craig, we'll turn to you first and then John. Yeah, okay. Um, so the, I, I, I would turn to, if, if people are looking for good places to go around um, biodiversity indicators, I would start to look at some of the um, documents coming out of the CBD um, coming out, uh, you know, um, Kunming, I think this year, um, especially around the idea of the what are they called essential biodiversity variables, um, and the challenge. And so uh, there's not time to go into those now. But um, I guess the point I want to make around that is, whilst we can do a lot of really good and interesting things with um, remote sensing related to kind of habitat and kind of biome level um, monitoring. Um, understanding structures and traits and functions of ecosystems um, is still difficult, regardless of whether you're looking at it from a satellite or from anywhere else. Um, um, but there, there have been a series of efforts looking at kind of individual species distributions and then starting to look at how those species um, interact with each other through organisations such as Map of Life and the work being done by the E.O. Wilson Foundation and um, I mean, IUCN themselves have had a long history in mapping species. Um, the challenge with all of those things is to have, basically, you know, you can use satellites to figure out what, what uh, roughly what the habitats are, and then you have to infer what species are in them based on observations of species with a bit more complexity, or quite a lot more complexity built into that. Um, and um, the challenge there is to do this at an operational level, because species don't stay still, populations don't stay the same size. Um, and so that's, I think, the next frontier that we're, we're, we're going to have to come across if we're going to use this type of information in business decisions. Um, and so I think there was a question earlier on about, you know, there's a, there's a lack of taxonomists out there now doing field work, which is absolutely true. I would, if I had time in my life, I would try and start a whole initiative around digital taxonomists and getting, um, you know, young scientists interested in like this augmenting their like natural kind of um, uh, interest in nature with technology. And there's loads of great examples of technology being used in um, um, to kind of accelerate scale, um, I guess, scale interest and excitement in nature and biodiversity. So the, there's a whole piece of work to be done there. Maybe someone can, can do that. That would be brilliant. Um, and so if you combine that then with um, models, machine learning, artificial intelligence, and remote sensing, all built onto cl like cloud computing systems, um, then it is possible to do kind of operational species mapping. And if you get operational species mapping, then you can start to look at layering up. They are the foundational like, blocks of ecosystems. So you get those layered up and you start to understand ecosystems better. And then you start to be able to do things like, if I remove this species from here, if I plant these wrong trees, 
if I do these things, what happens? Um, but we're probably, oh, well, not probably, I think there was a paper in Nature last, last year um, that talked about being about 20 to 30 years behind climate in terms of the modelling of, um, of what's going on in the world. So there has to be a huge acceleration in investment in that space in order for us to have the, the sophistication of understanding to, to go into the things then, into the things that visuality do, which is bringing those into businesses and into organisations. Um, so yeah, let's get more digital taxonomists out there and let's accelerate the funding in uh, species mapping, then we'll be good. Great, thanks Craig. And um, John, what did you want to add? Yeah, just quickly, because, um, you know, it's all about as well scalability and, you know, the default thinking around remote sensing, satellite imagery and biodiversity is we have to map out every species of plant in a particular location when, you know, if we unpack remote sensing and the data that we get, you know, things like the spectral signature, how different bands of light are reflected and absorbed by plants and vegetation, things like leaf area index, you know, that, that we get and also, you know, understanding the processes that the plants are going through. It's kind of clear that we, necessarily, we don't necessarily have to identify species to understand how diverse an environment is. And a good example is for you know a, a palm oil plantation on, on one on one end of the scale, you know it behaves very differently to a natural forest. But to actually understand that, that doesn't mean I need to identify it as a palm oil plantation. I could already see that from the spectral signature and the data that we get from satellite imagery. So without giving away the secret source in a way. Um, you know, we, we are developing bio biodiversity indices and, and monitoring tools, which kind of take away that layer of needed to identify, you know, mangoes from bananas, but understanding, you know, what is the satellite imagery, you know, really showing us from a kind of spectral variability perspective. And if this is also going to get another leg forward in the future when we have things like more multispectral and hyperspectral satellites being launched this year. So I think it's actually an exciting time to see the convergence of remote sensing and biodiversity monitoring going forward. Thanks very much. Um, we've had a question come in about the accuracy limits of these types of technologies and, and what investors um, in natural climate solutions or natural capital solutions um, or carbon projects need to be aware of. And um, Miriam, I'm gonna to come to you to answer the kind of question around accuracy and then maybe pick up on one of the other questions um, around social impact as well, thank you. Well, in terms of accuracy, I, I'd like to talk a bit broadly about, you know, um, the detail, the level of detail that you can access. There's two two barriers, really. The technology is there, you know, like ev everyone on this panel can do amazing things. The two barriers are, I would say, what is available. For example, commercially, you might have 30 centimetre accurate uh, resolution data which we are literally mapping turtle nests at the moment and mapping all the gazelles in a country but then actually the military might have access to 10 centimeter we believe or more so there's what's available to us commercially and then it's all down to affordability so for me um on one end of the scale we might have um investors who want to know hundreds of um, assets around the world and want a quick screen on their biodiversity net gain or loss over the last few years or ongoing and that we can do that with, with free data but it's not going to be accurate it's going to be a quick screen a quick pass if you want accurate data you got, you're going to then have to go into layering uh, solutions so you're going to have to go into we work on um, very innovative soil monitoring and health in for uh, the UAE um, and there we've got people on the ground and it's a desert environment people on the ground you have to pay for people on the ground you've got to have a uh, very custom built soil hyperspectral drone sensors flying around you've got um ai machine learning for predicting soil contaminants and then you've got the satellite imagery so in terms of accuracy that's what i would say you've got one end where we can do free quick screening very quickly if anyone engaged within a couple of months you can get or even actually in, within a week or days, you can get screening uh, to actually, this is a big complicated project. You need layers of information. If we're not confident that just remotely sensing will give you the accuracy you need. You need to validate it with ground or drone or um, so soil samples or machine learning. 
Great, thanks, Mariam. Before we turn to the social impact question, actually, I know that Alexis and Jason would like to come in. So, um, Alexis, um, what did you want to add here? Yeah, I just wanted to add a bit to the accuracy um, question, especially for areas where you have limited field data um, or there's not you know, resources to go out and have people collect field data for calibrating your remote sensing measurements, um, particularly in environments where it's really hostile um, and really remote. Um, we recently completed a project for Shell using social media data um, that has geolocated. So for example, people post tons of pictures every day of what they're doing, of their hikes, of their holidays, um, photos of these ecosystems that you can take that geolocation uh, and you can use that as almost as your boots on the ground person. You can see what that looks like at the time the photo was taken and where it was taken. Um, so we pulled in thousands and thousands of images um, to create uh, validation for our land cover maps um, in the Brazilian Cerrado. Um, so that's just another way that you could get at that accuracy. Wow, incredible. Um, Jason. Oh, I think you're muted, Lucy. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, Alexis, that's a really great point about inaccessible areas. Sometimes remote sensing data is the only measurement you can do. Um, so accuracy is certainly still important, but um, you know it's just important to recognize that it's maybe the only only measurement you can get. And I think generally for biodiversity monitoring, above ground biomass monitoring, really whatever you're doing, my intuition is that if you're trying to uh, measure large projects or regions or entire countries, satellite imagery is probably going to win the accuracy game every time, um, partly because of the sampling density it can provide and partly because it's just not feasible to, you know, hand measure things on those scales. Although it's important to, as Alexis mentioned, it's important to have some field measurements just to ground your models. Um, and then, you know, on the other end, if you're trying to measure something really, really small, like, you know, a meter or like a couple of trees scale, it'll be tough to beat ground measurements. So um, this isn't really a clear answer, but I think it's um, part, of, part of the challenge and what we're trying to figure out is like where along that spectrum, like, does is remote sensing, does remote sensing become the best, most accurate solution? And this goes back to, also what John was saying about, about gold standard, it's um, doing those studies and demonstrating successes and tying them to like actual field data and demonstrating that, um, you know, on certainly on larger scales and probably on some small and medium scales that remote sensing actually does provide the most accurate solution. Great, thank you, Jason. Um, we touched briefly on the topic of social impact um, and Mariam, there's a question that's come in around, could you explain in a little bit more how these technologies can help measure and monitor social impact? Is that something you could uh, elaborate on at all for us, please? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, our, our approach is, um, you know, we a company comes to us and they have some problems and we analyze their activities. And we will we like to consult at what the KPIs are for various um, touch points. And with this this whole conference today is about carbon um, and carbon sequestration. But actually, at the same time that we're collecting data, there are many uses for the data that we collect. It could be to um, meet metrics of your sustainable finance frameworks. It could be all sorts of departments that need the same data, and it could be broader than just measuring carbon. So it's not exactly, I'm not going to talk about earth observation, remote sensing, or machine learning. We, we are, you know, we're a digit, we have a digital arm that provides mobile and software, et cetera. So it's the design of the technology. A lot of the time, these projects might be in the global south where um, you have to assess the technology landscape. So as you're designing technology measurements, can someone read? Do you need voice rec recording? Do they have the internet? Can they use an, uh, an old phone to access the internet? Do they have a smartphone? Um, do they have, you know, Wi-Fi? All of the, the cost of data, et cetera. And with social impact, it's always going to be knowledge, theory of change with knowledge, attitude, and behavior. So um, measuring the social impact can often be done through e-learning uh, technology. So, or um, when things are actually happening, there is a project and you want to know what people think and you're measuring, creating um, engaging community platforms with peer-to-peer -peer 
uh, talk and showing stories of change can be very powerful because people learn best through uh, others' experiences and having fun, entertaining, engaging uh, technology um, um, modules to the, that platform. So, um, and that needs to be designed at the start of a project and take time to show the knowledge, attitude, behavior and show what's really going on and create that feeling of people can be open about what they think and feel. Great, thanks, Miriam. Um, John, I know you wanted to come in here. Yeah, you know, I, I just want to shift the focus slightly away from, you know, feeling that the burden of monitoring the impact socially should be on the remote sensing. You know, to be clear, like we're working on projects in Brazil, for example, where the local partner is the Nature Conservancy or on the ground facilitating the projects, right? We provide the monitoring, but we need someone on the ground who also helps like the indigenous landowners who are being helped you know, from the avoided deforestation or reforestation perspective. So we always have to take the local community into account. So I think if we kind of change the lens slightly and say, you know, we do want to scale these kind of initiatives, these kind of projects, which you know, restore ecosystems, preserve natural habitats, do help the local communities, Vera and Gold Standard in their methodologies, do also take those factors into account community benefits and biodiversity, for example, has its own separate kind of methodology. So if we can leverage the remote sensing and other technologies to scale these kind of projects, I think that's just a win-win from a real impact perspective, apart from just the pure monitoring side of things. Thank you. And Craig? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with John. Um, uh, I would add to just one final thing about where information could come from in order to monitor some of the more social human aspects of um, uh, of life, and it's um, and it's largely contained within large tech companies at the moment. You know, so if you want to understand what's happening in the world about people and their attitudes and their narratives, it's largely sitting in Google and Facebook and Twitter. Um, it's largely sitting in you know, TikTok and these other places where, uh, which is largely well, almost entirely unavailable. Um, uh, there are obviously APIs and things you can do, but it's not at the scale or um, that you would see from these from these companies. I don't know what to do about that, but that's just the way it is. Um, and so when we look for these kind of large scale monitoring systems for environment, we can turn to um, you know remote sensing. If you look for these, I mean, it's a bit. I don't know if you want to do it. Uh, large scale global monitoring of people. Um, they're sitting within just a handful of companies. Um, there's, there's something that should probably change about that too, but I mean, that's a discussion for another forum. Um, unless one of the people on the panel have been working a lot with these type of information, then you know, maybe that's interesting. Thanks, Craig. Um, we've had a couple of questions about kind of standardization um, and particularly um, sort of standardization of this type of work within MBS projects and also then what, which of the standards are most advanced in kind of uh, deploying these types of technologies. Does anyone from the panel want to comment? Um, John, maybe I can go to you for this one. Yeah, I think actually it ties in nicely with the earlier panel um, where, you know, there are issues in terms of connecting these projects with the broader finance ecosystem, let's say, uh, and the investor community. And one of the issues we have, and, and I'm kind of leaning on my prior commodities trading experience, is a real lack of standardization between different kinds of projects, different methodologies, different monitoring techniques. Um, it does obviously have a bit of a wild, wild west feel to it. So I, but I think we are seeing, you know, some kind of signs of hope. Um, I do think the standard agencies, for example, the Veras of this world, the gold standards, they are open to actually incorporating new monitoring tools. I think that's important to um, have making, in a way, this kind of asset class, if, if we were to call it, more fungible, um, because I think that's one of the kind of barriers we have if people want to talk about a forestry project or agriculture project or a blue carbon project. It's all very different in terms of um, the KPIs and, and, and how they can be viewed. So I think that's why we are, you know, at Geotree as a company, we want to focus firstly on monitoring all the nature-based solutions and giving a kind of um, overall feel for the key metrics. I think it's good that we have overarching principles of things like additionality, 
permanent leakage, which are kind of true for all carbon projects. Um, they kind of need to meet these criteria. So I think if we can leverage the monitoring solutions and the standards to make sure at least that we meet these kind of criteria, we're on the way to making this as an asset class probably more investable, more fungible and more understandable for the investor community. Um, but you know, admittedly, we're in, the early, we're in the early stages of this. I'd say biodiversity is even earlier than obviously just natural capital overall. Um, but you know, that's, that's just my take. I think we're moving progressively towards that and monitor, monitoring is, is one of the key tools to, to facilitate this. Thanks, John. And, and Alexis, I know you wanted to add something here too. Yeah, I just wanted to flag that there is um, in the works a global biodiversity standard um, that Botanic Garden Conservation International is putting together uh, and that's in the works. Um, and I, I think you'll hear more about that from Paul Smith later at the biodiversity monitoring session this afternoon. Great, thanks very much, Alexis. Um, well, this has been an excellent discussion and we've only got a few minutes left before people head off to lunch. So I think I'm just gonna ask each of the panelists to answer a question and you can answer as briefly as you like with one word or a few more if you need to. Um, but what, what do we need, what do you think needs to happen? What do we need to see more of to allow these types of technologies to reach their full potential to service both the goals of climate and uh, nature. So um, whoever wants to come in first, please feel free to come off mute and uh, just give us a response of what would you, in your ideal world, what would you like to see more of in the next 10 years? Yeah, I Jason. think, yeah. Uh... Two quick things to echo John's point just now, we need really well aligned and standardized KPIs for any of this to, to work. Um, and the second thing that's always on my mind is that supply chains are still way too opaque. If you ask a company where their palm oil or soy or cocoa originates, they generally don't know. Um, and that's changing, especially with the forthcoming EU deforestation regulations, um, but you know, not, not quickly enough. So we can monitor biomass, biodiversity, uh, all, all manner of things in the world right now. But if companies don't have their supply chains mapped all the way down to the source, no one's ultimately gonna be accountable for anything that we measure, um, you know, whether from space, the ground or anywhere. So yeah, one thing, we, we really need supply chain transparency. That's a huge barrier right now. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, Miriam. Um, I'd say two things, I think, um... What I feel is that there are lots of the um, new cutting edge sustainable finance frameworks being created right now, such as the TNFD. But I feel like, you know, technologists aren't at the table really enough. I think the scientists are, the financiers are, but they should let us have a seat at the table to help create and shape um, what these frameworks could be. And I think if I was gonna be uh, um, idealistic in the next 10 years, um, I think we're all going to be working on different patches of intelligence on the earth, but really, you know, with natural capital, it's all one system. So really it's joining everything up together, everyone somehow having a global collaboration um, with all the information intelligence we, we um, gain. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna to go to Craig, then Alexis, then John to close us out. Okay, um, I agree wholeheartedly with what everyone said so far. And so I'm gonna try and fit it into three, three pieces, um, openness, um, community collaboration and hope. Okay, so um, openness I'm talking about uh, as as a, has been a thread for me in this in this session, which is building businesses where openness is a central pillar, um, and that, that means figuring out how you can make money and how you can add value where you share information, whether that's code methodologies and data to a whole community, um, and still have a successful business. That might mean that you're not, um, you know, uh, I don't know, a unicorn making billions of dollars, but it might. Um, but what it will mean is that we actually solve the major problems of, of, of society over the next decade. Um, so that would be my first one. I think you, this will only work if there is deeper collaboration between nonprofits, finance, um, 
you know, technologists, as Miriam pointed out, and um, uh, civil society. Um, I think these sort of collaboratives are probably going to be the method by which landscapes are planned and formed. And this, these aren't my ideas. These ideas are coming from largely, not everywhere, but largely from the non-profit community. So then how do we build technology to support those collaborations, both in terms of technology, uh, data, um, and also interfaces and technology to help? I think that's a really critical point. Um, those collaborations, by the way, will also require um, an understanding of where is important in the world to protect. And I think this is where the hope comes in. I think we know we need to protect and um, conserve, um, let's say, half of the planet, as E.O. E. Wilson would say. Um, and there is a certain there's a the certainty of hope around that, and it's absolutely possible. Um, technology can inspire. Technology can um, influence and change people's lives, and I think um, introducing hope into there, I think, is, is absolutely critical. Um, yeah, openness, community, and hope. Let's go with that. Thank you, Craig. Um, Alexis, and then John. Yep, uh, I would actually just want to echo um, what some of the other panelists have said about transparency of where things are happening in the supply chain. Um, as Jason was saying, we can't uh, attribute um, cause to anything that if we don't know where the plantations actually are um, from a specific corporation. Um, and also thinking about collaboration and data collection. Um, again, particularly in places where we don't think there's a lot of data already collected or on the ground data that communities can be collecting. I think there needs to be more of an openness and a kind of a data sharing environment um, while still allowing everyone you know, to have successful companies and run successful businesses because there's a lot of data that's being collected in areas where we all need that information, um, but it's just not being shared effectively. Um, and I'd like to bring in, particularly in academia as well, tons of studies are going on, academic studies, where people are out in the field collecting tons of plot data, but we don't see any of that. It all goes into you know, scientific publications. So ideally, if there was some sort of huge platform where people could freely upload field plot data for the better of, you know, the better of global society and, and tackling things like climate change and biodiversity loss, that would be the ideal scenario. Great, thank you. John. Yeah, I think uh, Miriam actually summed it up very nicely with an example. Um, if it does feel like we do have a few silos and echo chambers, um, you know, we, we try as a company to um, embody the collaboration of Venn diagram between carbon finance and institutional capital and the research side, um, so, you know, and it's reflected in our people. But, um, but yeah, I think going forward, that's gonna be more and more of an issue. Um, I think there's also a fracturing within finance. You have the DeFi movement, which we haven't really touched on. You know, I, I imagine in a future session, um, if not in this edition, in a future year of this conference, there'll probably be an entire blockchain um, round table. Uh, but you have huge engagement um, on chain now when it comes to you know capital going to nature so I think we need to really act as a bridge to bring all these different communities together um, to, to actually scale these solutions but um, but at least at least at the very least we have global interest so I think that's a great starting point um, for that effort great thank you very much and um, thank you very much to all our um audience for your interest. Um, it's been excellent engagement in this session, really, really good questions. Thank you, particularly to our five panelists. Um, there is so much more to learn about these areas and hopefully uh, you can get in touch with them directly um, through the platform if you've got any follow-up questions that you weren't able to ask. Um, we asked a poll at the beginning of this about how confident are you that technology will enhance the integrity of nature-based solutions? Um, and it's, I'm very pleased to hear that you're a bunch of optimists out there, which is great. So we had 66.7 uh, of you very confident, 22% somewhat confident and 11 a little nervous and thankfully only 0% who have no clue, which is good to know on a, on a technical experts group like this. Um, so thank you very, very much. Um, uh, great conversation and hope to, um, I hope you will enjoy your lunch. Anyway, thanks for your time today.